So here you have a poor woman who's avoiding people. On top of that, she's a Samaritan. So she's, she's the wrong race. She lives in the wrong neighborhood. She's had a hard life. She's had five husbands. She's shacking. So the guy she's with now is not her husband. She has to get her own water. She's broke. And she's marginalized from society. And Jesus chooses to go after her. This is probably one of the lowest people in the social class of Jesus' day. This is definitely not, let me try to get a business meeting with you. This is like, I'm going to have to go out of my way for you. And so Jesus does. Jesus tells her in verse 7 and 8, Give me a drink, which means as a Jew, her uncleanness wasn't an obstacle for him. It was an opportunity for him. What would have been a wall for others was a bridge for Jesus. Fear builds walls. Love builds bridges. In verse 8, we learn that Jesus sent his disciples to buy food in a Samaritan city. So when Jesus said, it is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him that defiles him, he really meant it. Now, the woman is about to go into the real heart of the matter, and the heart of the matter in those days are the same matter that we're dealing with in our days. And she was about to get into the issue, and the issue is sexism and racism. She says to him, I'm a woman, and you're a Jew. Which means, first of all, your people don't deal with my people, number one. Number two, you're a man, I'm a woman. So there's two walls here that Jesus steps over to minister to her. The Samaritan woman addresses the issue of sexism and racism. Then Jesus starts to talk about himself. Watch this. In verse 9, um, in verse 9, uh, the Samaritan woman said unto him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God. So she's addressing racism and sexism and Jesus begins to talk to himself that is, Jesus is the only answer for racism and sexism anything that would try to take someone and put them less than you or put them lower than you the only thing that equals the playing field is Jesus she's talking about the issue of the day and he's talking about the solution She's talking about the problem. He's saying, right here. Now, um, we see in Ephesians 2.16 that the cross slays racial enmity. Uh, Jesus was not alone with this woman. Now, there have been some people who, who use this scripture to push on the fact, uh, they think is the fact that Jesus was alone with woman. It's incorrect. Jesus was not alone with this woman. And I can, I'll tell you why Jesus wasn't alone with this woman. Jesus was not alone with this woman because if he was alone with this woman, we wouldn't have this story. John carefully writes in 1 John 1.1 1, 1, that the things that he wrote, he heard, saw, looked upon, and handled concerning the word of life. So John is not regurgitating a story he heard from someone else. He's telling you what he saw with his own eyes. See, if you look very carefully in the Gospel of John, there's things that John picks up on that other people don't get. John 17, he sees the Lord praying. He, he, John, when others are asleep, John is engaged. Those who press in and those who, who will hang in there, those who wait a little bit longer, those who will be a little bit more patient, those who will you know just kind of go the extra mile will get more. It's not called striving. It's called loving God with your strength. So John, the beloved, who is the author of this story, was present while this was happening. That's why we have this story. In John 14, Jesus says, I will give you a drink and it will become a well. 
Paul said that we were made to drink of one spirit. So when Jesus is saying you will never thirst again, he's saying you will never thirst for anything else. Here, Jesus is talking about a change of appetite from the inside out. Eternal life is to know God, and when we know God, we are thirsty for different things. In verse 15, she's still talking about natural things. She's still saying, you know, you don't have anything to draw with. She's still not cognizant to what is really happening. She's not, she's there, but she's not really there. What is interesting, what I, what I think is, at least what I find is interesting is as he begins to, um, you know, well, we'll watch. Um, in verse 16, Jesus gets down to business and says, go call your husband. The woman shares half of the truth. She says, I don't have a husband. She, she didn't throw out all her cards on the table. She said, I don't have a husband. She told half the truth. Jesus told the whole truth. Jesus had a detailed word of knowledge about her past and about her present situation. The woman makes a personal conversation, a religious debate. Jesus is talking about her dysfunctional relationships and about the sin in her life. And he's doing it because he loves her. He's not doing it because he's, he's trying to shame her or he's trying to embarrass her. He's, he's engaging with her and he's putting his hand on her pain because that's the thing that will stop her from drinking and he wants to give her a drink. So the woman makes a personal conversation. Uh, Jesus is now addressing her issue, who she's living with, her struggle, and then she tries to tries to make it a religious thing. Well, where do we worship at? I've seen people do it on the streets all the time. You're hitting them, you're talking to them, you're sharing the love of God with them, and they want to argue with you about some sort of weird doctrine, some sort of peripheral issue, some sort of you know issue, because they don't want to get down to the real issue. And that's the same thing church people can do too. We evade the truth. We, we, wanna, we don't want to get transparent with people. We don't want to say, hey, I got a problem. You know, I have an issue. I'm struggling with porn. I'm struggling with, um, you know, stealing at work when no one's looking. You know, I'm struggling with, we don't want to get real. We, we say, amen, brother. But the breakthrough happens when we get real. Now, in verse 21, Jesus explains where uh, people worship no longer matters. Now, this is a very, very touchy thing. You guys have to understand. God's name is written in Jerusalem. It is the city of the great king. The, uh, the, there is profound history. God himself has ordained this temple. I mean, when Jesus is saying these things, guys, these are radical things where people wanted to kill him because he was bringing in a new message in a new way and people couldn't handle this. Th this was really like, like, you've got to understand, he's saying, okay, the first 1500 years up until now is now becoming irrelevant because everything is about to change and everything that was a type and a shadow and a picture is standing before you today and I'm here to change things. See, in the Old Covenant, everything, the Old Covenant is the preservation of a seed. The new covenant is the revelation of a son. The old covenant was shadows. The new covenant, the true light shines in our hearts. The old covenant was Moses' face had to be veiled. The new covenant is we with unveiled face beholding the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. The old covenant, you touch a leper, you get sick. The new covenant, you touch a leper, they get cleansed. The old covenant, you had a mediator who was imperfect. The new covenant, you have a perfect mediator. The new covenant is, based, is with a better mediator based on better promises. So when we look to the old covenant as a high watermark, we're selling ourselves short, which is the original temptation Satan brought to them in the garden. And we're still buying it. Wow. So, 
Jesus comes with this message of, of like things are changing now. <laughs> He's like, now things are changing. Like, all right. Now, God was requiring something different. Worship is about Jesus. Jesus is modeling worship, but he isn't singing. Now, I, I, I loved our time earlier. I live with the worship team. I, 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 I love it. Except, worship is not limited to singing. Singing is a part of worship. Singing in and of itself is not worship. In fact, the person who knew the most about worship didn't even play an instrument. And the only time he sang a song in the Gospels is when the cross was before him. And the tradition is that Jesus sang on the Mount of Olives with the cross before him. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's what very, very, very smart, really educated people believe. That that was the song he sang with his disciples with the cross before him. Overlooking the city of God. Standing on the Mount of Olives singing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it as he was going to walk into Jerusalem and offer his life for the sins of mankind. So, and we can't even fully prove that that's the song that he sang. That's just what really smart people think. Worship, watch this, is not about your geographical location or your denominational affiliation. Worship is about crossing cultural, racial, and religious lines. It's about loving the person in front of you. Worship is intentionally pursuing what others avoid. It's about reaching out to the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised. Worship is about being led by the Holy Spirit and speaking God's word into those people who have not heard. Jesus is going to go and tell her about worship. How can he be telling her about worship if he's not demonstrating worship? When he brings it up, it's because he's been demonstrating it. 22, 422, Jesus tells the American woman that they don't know what they worship or what they are doing. Because worship, because uh, salvation or rescue is of the Jews. Jesus steps on everyone's toes. He doesn't just step on the Jews' toes. He steps on the Samaritans' toes as well. He says, lady, your people don't know. You don't know what you're talking about. Stop. Have you ever heard someone say, stop that? You don't know what you're talking about. Jesus is, if he was from New Jersey, he'd look her in the face and say, you don't know what you're talking about. Stop. He's saying, you worship what you don't know. Meaning, the law was given to the Jewish people. They were the ones who have the ordinances of God, who have the commands of God, who have the word of God, who are testifying of Jesus. He's saying, lady, you don't know what you're doing. You have no clue. You people and your people don't know. But what does he see? He sees her sincerity. And her sincerity is what brought out what she needed to know. His goodness and her sincerity. 423. In the midst of this conversation, Jesus knows what the Father is doing. Jesus knew the Father was looking for worshipers. Again, we want to do something, but God wants to make us something. We want to change the world. God wants to get the world out of us. We're almost done. True worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. That is only possible in Jesus. Watch this. The Jews worshiped in truth, but not in spirit. They had the word of God. They had the ordinances of God. They knew, like, kill the bull, kill the lamb, do this, do that. Like, they knew to the letter what God required, yet their heart was not in it, so they didn't do what God required. 
The Samaritans worshipped in spirit, but not in truth. Because they didn't know the ordinance of God, the laws of God. They did not know to the same degree that the Jews knew. So you have a group of people, and this is, you have the same group of people in the body of Christ today. You have spiritual people who are emotional, who fly around the room, who are crazy, who are passionate, but they're like a city with no walls. All spirit, no truth. They're weak. They can't stand temptation. They're, they're, they're not strong. They can't tell you about their faith. But they're passionate. And they're sincere. And then you have other people. They know everything about the Bible. They know everything. They know everyone who's wrong. They know why those other passionate people are wrong. They know why everyone's wrong. But they don't do nothing. What Jesus is painting a picture here is it's actually not one or the other, it's both. It's not, you know, swing from the sandaliers and live like the devil. Right? It's be passionate, be holy. Be led by the Spirit, know the Word of God. Hold fast to the truth, walk in the Spirit. And so he's saying, what Jesus is saying, what, what this is saying, he goes, listen, the Jews, you guys, they don't get it. The Samaritans, you guys don't even know because salvation, rescue is of the Jews. So you guys don't, you're not, you don't even know. Like, you should, in other words, that woman should be happy that Jesus was talking to her. But what, we're, what we see is this beautiful picture of spirit and truth worship is only possible in Jesus. The religious law, all of the ordinances, all of the sincerity that humans have is simply not enough. It needs to be in Jesus because in Jesus and only in Jesus can we worship in spirit and in truth. Amen. Only in Jesus can I offer something that is acceptable to God. God only deals through, with humanity through His Son. That means Jewish people who do not know Jesus are not saved. That means Buddhist people who think they're praying to God are not praying to God. God does not hear them. That means Muslims who bow down five times a day and pray to Allah, they're not talking to the God of the Bible. He doesn't hear them. The only way God engages, relates to humanity is through His Son. And the only way the body of Christ can offer worship in spirit and in truth that is acceptable, that is pleasing to God, is through His Son. Now, what's interesting here is the Father is seeking uh, worshipers, not worship. Are you following me? But the word there is not, it's the word prostration. Now, I want to share about this word because this word is important because it shows us something that we need to see. We're like in the semi-ghetto. It's not really the hood, but it's kind of hoodish. And so, by putting yourself face down, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position. I could have someone walk in here, stomp on my head and break my neck. What if one of you guys in the first row went crazy, picked up a chair, and smashed it against my head? I don't know what you're, I don't know what's in your head. I've already watched people pull, pick chairs up and hit people with chairs. I mean, I've seen all kinds of crazy things. So, I mean, you know, in, in, in common language, by me sitting here laying on the floor, I'm taking a risk. Because I don't, I don't know all of you. I don't know what you're, I don't, how do I know? How do I know someone doesn't walk in from the bar, drunk, coked out? It sees me on the floor and wants to kick me in the leg. I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So when, when worship is described as prostrate, what it's talking about is a place of complete and total surrender, complete and total trust, complete and total abandonment, complete and total vulnerability to, one, to, to that person. That we're worshiping. That's why if you, there's a song that Matt Redmond sings. It's so awesome. But he sings. He goes, worship starts with seeing you. Our hearts respond to your revelation. 
Worship starts with seeing you. That's powerful because if you look at all of the men in the Old Testament and even John, when they saw a glorified risen Christ, when they saw Jesus in eternity with eyes like flames of fire, the, what happened to every single one of them is they fell on their face. Boom. They lost it because their human physical body cannot take all that Jesus is, so the only thing that the human makeup can do is just fall. Like John, who knew Jesus, who was Jesus' best friend, who walked with Jesus for years, who saw him transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, who saw him overcome death, who saw him walk through walls, walk on water, who saw him do all kinds of crazy stuff, saw the glorified, risen, glorified, resurrected Son of God, and it says that I fell at his feet like a dead man. And God is looking for people who will do that with their whole entire life, with their whole entire existence. Jesus is not looking for believers. The Bible doesn't say go make believers in all of the world. The Bible says make disciples. Disciples are those who lay down their life. When Jesus says, lay down your life, when he says, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, he's saying, this is what a worshiper is. A worshiper is not someone who sings, dances, shouts, and spits. A worshiper is someone who lays down their life. That's the picture. When you see someone prostrated, when they're on their face, there, there, there is no other focus. There is, there, there is nothing in their line of sight. There is, there are just total, boom. And we need to see that. That needs to be who we're becoming. Because in the kingdom, and the way it works with the things of God, is unless you lay down, you cannot rise up. Unless you humble yourself, you cannot be exalted. So you will try to do things in your own strength and in your own way, but God's signature is not on it. So if you want his signature on it, then first you have to go through that uncomfortable part of the process, which is lay down your life. Lay down. Lay down. Humble yourself. Uh, serve. Like all those things that we resist, we hate, we think. But those are the things that are actually what build us and make us sustainable in the kingdom. And trustworthy. And solid and steady that's why I, I would rather take the long way than try to go the fast way and not not build a solid foundation I would rather have 15 people 20 people 30 people 40 people truly get a hold of Jesus truly get a hold of the gospel because I want to see a church here not an audience Jesus is not looking for an audience Many people have an audience. They don't have a church. I don't want an audience. Jesus is not looking for that. John 4, 25 and 26 tells her plainly that he is the Messiah. The woman, verse 28, naturally brings the men of the city to Jesus. Worship is bringing people to Jesus, and worship is bringing Jesus to people. There's two models, and one is come and see, and the other one is go and tell. Both of them are important. Both of them communicate the heart of God. Both of them demonstrate what the kingdom of God is like. What is interesting is Jesus spends two days with the Samaritans and they declare him to be the savior of the world. So the first people group that actually knew who Jesus was was not the Jews. It was the Samaritans. The Samaritans declared that Jesus was the savior of the world. Now what's fascinating here is in this narrative we don't see any miracles being done. We don't hear of any miracles being done. All you have is Jesus talking to them. Their hearts were positioned correctly 
And so they knew who he was. See, when your heart, let me say it this way. When our hearts are positioned correctly, we know who we are. When our hearts are positioned correctly, we know who other people are. We know who we are in relation to that other person. We know who we are in relationship to God. We, we know what's what and who's who. When our heart is in the right position, we are discerning. We are receptive. We are perceptive. We are we we see. We can we can connect the dots. We're 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 reading between the lines. We, you know. People think that if you're love, you know, if you're loving, you're stupid. That's ridiculous. It's actually the truth of the matter is the more loving you are, the more sharp you are. Because love sees right through. It still believes the best, but it knows what's going on. Paul, uh, there's a prayer where Paul says that I pray that your love would abound in knowledge and in discernment. So love and discernment are not separate. They're together. So you have Jesus talking about worship to a woman who has no instrument, who has no musical talent, who has no position in a church, no position in a synagogue. She has no really good standing. She's already had five husbands. She's kind of a skanky lady. I'm just going to be honest. I mean, this is what it is. He said you have five husbands. That's not a very positive thing. Right? Are you following me? Are you guys okay? Yeah. Yeah. We alright? No, no one's mad at me? <laughs> okay. So you have this, this marginalized outcast that Jesus decides to reveal what the Father is actually looking for. It was almost like Jesus was demonstrating what worship is in his interaction with her by going out of his way for someone, by giving someone a shot that others wouldn't, by crossing racial and religious lines, by crossing geographical lines, by going the way that others wouldn't, by doing what others wouldn't, by listening to God, by moving in the Spirit, by giving prophetic words. And he even takes it to the next level. He stays with the Samaritans for two days. So all those churches from those Assyrian people that are still persecuted in the Middle East, the seed of those churches were a two-day stay with Jesus. He hung out with them for two days. And that was a seed for their generations. And now you still have people who are steadfast in their faith, who are Assyrian Christians, who are butchered and killed for Jesus. But the testimony of the Lord and the gospel continues to, to just, you know, it was good ground, and so it's still bearing fruit. 